Good day and uh, assalamualaikum. I am uh, Dr. Ahmad Zuri from the School of Electrical Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, UTM, University of Technology, Malaysia. Welcome to our distinguished lecture series organized by the Faculty of Engineering, uh, UTM. This is our 25th lecture since we started the program in June 2020. Today, we are honored to have with us Professor Dr. Muhammad Derish, who is affiliated with the King Fahd University of Petroleum and Minerals, uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The topic of his lecture today is qualitative assessment of visual quality for image and video, present and future. Now, without any further delay, I would like to hand over this session to the Dean Faculty of Engineering, Professor Datuk Engineer Dr. Muhammad Rafiq bin Datuk Abdul Kadir. Uh, over to you, Prof. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Ahmad Zuri. Thank you for chairing the session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, hello and welcome, everyone. Welcome to our 25th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq, and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Muhammad Darish from King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, Saudi Arabia. A bit about our presenter today. Dr. Muhammad Darish received his undergraduate degree from the National Polytechnic School of Algeria in 1985. He then joined University of Minnesota, USA, where he completed his MS and PhD in 1988 in 1992 respectively. He worked as a postdoctoral fellow with the University of Minnesota Radiology Department in the area of MRI. He then joined the Queensland University of Technology Australia as a lecturer in 1994 and then as associate professor in the year 2000. In 2001, he joined the Electrical Engineering Department at King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, Saudi Arabia where he is currently leading the signal processing group. He has published over 150 refereed papers and delivered a number of tutorial and invited talks at international conferences. He is the recipient of the IEEE Third Millennium Medal for the year 2000. In the year 2006, he received the Shulman Award for the best researcher in the Arab world in the area of engineering sciences and in 2009, he received the Excellence in Research Award at KFUPN. Dr. Darish has supervised more than 20 PhD and master's students and more than 60 Bachelor of Science theses in the areas of signal and image processing. He completed more than 20 major funded research projects, including grants from the Australian Research Council, ARC, and King Abdul Aziz City for Science and Technology, KACST, Saudi Arabia. So that is a biography of our speaker. Here now is Professor Muhammad Darish from King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, Saudi Arabia, with a talk entitled Quantitative Assessment of Visual Quality for Images and Videos, Present and Future. Professor Muhammad Darish, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Muhammad Rafiq. Thanks, Professor Ahmed Zuri. It is indeed a pleasure for me to be among, with you, among you here. And uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those who are in the afternoon. And uh, UTM is very special university for me. I visited it a couple of times a few years ago. And we have, we have had some collaboration with uh, excellent faculty from there and co-supervised students as well. It's my pleasure to come back to UTM, even though we are doing it online or remotely. So uh, welcome again to this presentation. And this presentation is actually an overview about the challenges that we are facing 
in the multimedia world. And specifically, we are going to see that there are many challenges still there that we are going to, that we are facing and uh, work is being done as we speak on these topics. So as you can see, uh, the title is about objectively assessing quality of visual, uh, visual information uh, and in particular images and videos. So this is a long outline, but don't worry too much about it because we are going to skip, skip some of these things. We are going to concentrate on the more important issues. So why do we need image quality assessment? Now, as we know, there is a famous saying that says a, an image is worth a thousand words. Now, the problem is that if this image is distorted, all of these thousand words are distorted as well. So, and the distortion can come from different uh, phases of image acquisition, image transformation, image compression, enhancing, manipulating, and all of us have seen how much uh, deterioration we can see uh, in images that we receive, how much manipulation, how much fake news do we see because of these manipulations and so on. So it is important to have some sort of measures that would quantify the quality of the information that we see visually. An example of that, for instance, is to have a very simple icon when you open YouTube, for instance, that gives you some sort of score that shows you that this image or this video has a quality of 8.9 or 9.8 or whatever. Obviously, to quantify this is not an easy issue because we are dealing with humans, means that we have to take into account what we call the human visual system. So it's important in control, control uh, quality control application, in imaging applications, and so on. I will mention some of the, the, the distortions that images are uh, uh, subjected to. For instance, and before even I engage into the distortion, I can also speak about the other side of the spectrum, which is not distortion, but enhancement, meaning that if I have a distorted image and two guys, two techniques, two systems try to enhance this image, how do I quantify which image is good, which image is better? Obviously, with the human eye, it's easy to do. But when it comes to quantifying it mathematically using a computer, it's a challenging problem. So you can see that images are distorted because of a couple of things. For instance, blurring. Blurring can be due to low pass filtering, for instance, can be due to motion, can be due to a number of things. And a really a blurred image is terrible to look at. How do we quantify that? How do we quantify the deterioration due to compression? Obviously, images are huge when it comes to storage, we need to compress them, especially when we, with video. How do we evaluate, how do we quantify how much uh, an image was uh, distorted? When we enhance images, you see, when we enhance images, we tend to enhance edges. And usually when we, together with the edges, if you look at the, I will send you this PDF, if you look around the flower, you will see kind of new edges because of what we call contrast enhancement. In painting, for instance, removing the boat in this case, so we need to do some sort of filling, but by doing the filling, we distort some of the original information. How do we quantify that? In video streaming, for instance, uh, when we send it, when we send data or video through a certain channel, there is some sort of distortion. How do we take that into account? How do we rectify it? How do we quantify it? So there are two issues, rectifying or solving the problem of distortion, trying to remove the distortion. And the second issue is to quantify the amount of distortion. 
Another example is, for instance, when we enter some sort for security reasons, watermarks. As you can see, we enter the, the word watermark. There will be a distortion coming from that. How do we quantify the quality of the watermark image? In color printing, for instance, obviously the printers have a limited number of colors. So the colors will change as we go. So if I gave you printer one, printer two, and printer three, how do you compare the quality of these printers? In medical imaging, it's extremely important because what we are going to do is usually if we have a mammogram that we are going to, to send over uh, overseas or from a rural region to a city, we have to do some sort of compression. What happens when we do this compression? Are we going to miss some very important issues in the mammogram? Which could be detrimental because what's going to happen is that you may have a diagnosis based on these mammograms and you may miss some micro calcifications, which means that you may even miss some cancer uh, uh, lumps, which is, could be detrimental for the person. Aliasing, whether we are speaking about a, low, uh, a resolution in time, a resolution in space, or a resolution in a number of bits, all of these introduce some sort of distortion. This is, for instance, when we reduce the number of, uh, bit, uh, number of uh, pixels per, uh, or size of the image. Uh, what we call also the chromatic distortion, which is due to what we call color bleeding. And as you can see the, in the corner, bottom right, the red color, when processed, turned to be on a little bit smeared, smashed on the white color. Mosquito effects, jagged motion, all of these, and you can see that scalar quantization itself, whether we use eight bits per pixel or three bits, as you introduce less and less bits to represent the image information, you will end up with some sort of noise and which we usually represent but what we call by what we call the uh, uh, signal to no uh, quantization noise ratio. But is it the only one? Is it the right one? Does it fit really how people see or how humans see quality? Non-linear, non-uniform illumination, same problem. So you can see that there are many, 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 because the, we have a huge pipeline from the acquisition from deciding on the number of bits, from deciding on the spatial resolution, from pre-processing the data, from compressing it, from detecting objects, all of these pipeline of tasks introduce some sort of distortion. How do we quantify this? How can we have a measure that tells me that as humans, we can easily say that it's an excellent quality, it's a low quality. Even as a human, by the way, we, it's difficult to go, give a certain number, but at least you can have a sense. How do we embed that knowledge into a computer to be able to, want, to quantify the quality? Okay, this is an example of distortion. And for video, and you can see that for video distortion, also there are many types of distortions that you need to take into account. It could be what we call mosquito effect. It could be uh, black and uh, uh, black uh, salt and pepper uh, noise. It could be motion, and it could be pink noise, and so on. It doesn't have to be white noise. So that's why the concept itself of image quality assessment has been uh, reformulated into two categories. One category is what we call the subjective techniques and we are going to speak about that. And one category are the objective techniques. So we are more interested in the objective techniques. The subjective techniques are basically what a human does, what a human person does. So in the sub objective techniques, we will see that they also, they can be split in a number of fashion. So subjectively, usually we use what we call the most, the mean opinion score, and you can, Think of it as follows. You can give an image uh, with certain rating to 10 or 15 or 20 people and ask them to give some sort of rating as to what is the quality of this image. 
what do we when we speak about uh, objective quality measurement or measures or indices or scores or matrix all of these words are used in the literature so in the and we have three cases uh, by order of difficulty the easiest one is what we call full reference techniques and in full reference techniques we have the original image by the way the original each image itself can be distorted then you have a degraded image so you have a blurred image or whatever and you want to see the difference how do we quantify the difference remember the difference may not be just a pixel type of difference that's the easiest way to think about it so in this case we have a test a reference image we have a test image we do some sort of pre-processing we uh, extract maybe some features and we do some uh, we come come up with some sort of cost function that looks at the difference between these feature sets in the reduced reference method it says that instead of giving me the original image just give me some useful information from this origin image. This could be features, this could be transform domain features, for instance, FFT or wavelet or some sort of statistical features. And what I'm going to do when you give me a distorted image, I'm going to extract the same features and I will look at the difference in the feature domain. So instead of looking at the, the difference in the data domain, we look at the features, uh, we look at the difference in this. So that's why I don't need the original image, but I just need reduced information. On. That's why we call it reduced reference. So you can see that for reduced reference, we have the reference from which we extract parameters. And from the test image, we extract the same parameters and we have some sort of difference between the two. The most challenging case is what we call it is what we call the uh, no reference techniques so basically i give you an image i give you a video it could be subject to twenty thousand types of distortions and i want you to give me a score for it this is the most difficult so in this case we need to do some sort of training to understand how humans perceive uh, quality meaning that I have a number, large number, a database of images with scores that were given by humans. The computer tries to understand the, what important information is in the image and match them with the scores. Once the model, the learning model is available, when you give me a test image, I will just see where does it fit within this database? How close is it to the category of best images or low quality images? And uh, the way we do it, we usually look at, for instance, edge information. We look at quantization errors. We look at structure, for instance, a certain face, a certain image, certain edge with a certain background. How does this change? How can we quantify, for instance, the blurring effect, which is kind of a low-pass filtering effect? And we need to understand that there is a small distinction between where, what, we use, what we call fidelity and quality. We are focusing on quality. Fidelity is just basically looking at a certain error without taking into account how, how our, as humans perceive quality. So we are going to speak more of quality here. So before speaking about uh, objective techniques in uh, quality assessment, we we'll speak about first subjective techniques. How do they work? So for instance, you can choose a certain test video sequence or an image, have some sort of setting in terms of uh, a protocol to evaluate the scores, Choose a certain test method, whether it's a double stimulus or single stimulus. Carry the testing, then do some sort of mean opinion score or an averaging over uh, multiple viewers. And when we speak about stimulus, we speak about either double stimulus or single stimulus. In double stimulus, I give you the two images. 
And I don't tell you which one is the origin, which one is the distorted, and I let you vote which one is better. And you give some sort of rating. In single stimulus, and this is mostly what we do, I will just give you an image and I tell you to give a rating between 0 and 1 or between 0 and 100, where you can see the score, they go, which is kind of a Likert uh, scale, between bad, poor, fair, good, and excellent. Okay, the major problem with the uh, with these techniques is that, as we said, it's, they are subjective. So you need a lot of uh, viewers to do this, and each time you do an experiment, you need to develop uh, put a lot of resources for it. Each time you develop a technique, you need to put a lot of resources for it, and so on. So we try to avoid these subjective image quality assessment techniques in practice. However, the good news is that we do have kind of very standard databases where the subjective quality measurement is done, meaning that database contains 800 images with different levels of noise, different types of noise, and you are given the score for these images. And this will be used as a benchmark when you develop your technique to decide on whether you are doing a good job or not. And as you can see, basically, it's an averaging process over multiple viewers. So the whole issue here, can we mimic the human visual system on how we perceive quality? Okay. So we need a mathematical model. And the goal is to develop a quantitative matrix or measure or index or uh, uh, measure that can predict perceived image quality. And it can be used, for instance, in benchmarking. For instance, when you have two algorithms for, say, enhancement or removing noise or compression, how do I compare that my technique is better than yours? So I can do, I can use this objective matrix to say, no, the indices here tells me that uh, technique T, A is better than technique B. So you can see the importance of this. Because you can see that just visual difference does not tell you a lot. For instance, I took an original image. I looked at the difference between a, the original image and a compressed, decompressed image. And you can see that you have black and white where there is an error, where there is no error. Well, you can look at it the other way around. You can put white where there is an error and black where there is no error. But it doesn't tell me much. How do we quantify whether this error is large or small? And this is what we are going to uh, speak about. So we said that in full reference, we have both images. And we are used to this concept of, in signal processing, to this concept of mean square error or signal-to-noise ratio or peak signal-to-noise ratio. And it has been used quite often, I mean, for a long time even though we said that the full reference scenario is very easy. And if I were to look at two, the, to the two expressions here, you have the mean square error, which is kind of difference between uh, pixel to pixel. So meaning that if you have an image which is shifted by one pixel or only, even though the image is exactly the same, visually when you look at it, you see exactly the same thing. But because of this one pixel shift, you may have a very large MSE, which is defined basically as the average signal power or the, uh, over the average noise power. And the uh, noise, noise in this case is the error between the origin and the uh, manipulated image or distorted image. We have also the SNR. Obviously, the SNR is a, is a kind of a log representation of the MSE. And then we have the peak SNR. The peak SNR, instead of looking at the no signal power over the noise power, it, should, it looks at the maximum signal power. So basically, in an image with 8 bits, we have L, which is the largest number, which is 255. In this case, it would be 255 of a square. And here, basically, the PSNR is a kind of tells you that this value is not image dependent. It looks at the maximum value possible in an image. 
Obviously, the PSNR is a little bit larger than the SNR, and we use it quite often to uh, represent distortion in image manipulation. Uh, however, you can see that there is a big problem. And you can see that the last six images here, the MSE is almost identical. But obviously, the last one, for instance, which has the MSE of 308, is much worse than the first one, which has an MSE of 3.6. Because we said that it's only uh, based on values. It does not, it does not represent how we see it as human. These are just other techniques that have been proposed for uh, measuring quality. And maybe the last one is the most important one, which says that instead of doing the quality assessment in the time domain or space domain, I do it in frequency domain, and I use some sort of uh, function that represents what frequencies do we focus on as humans. And I'm going to give the error in these frequencies, okay, a higher value or a higher cost, so I can represent the distortion better. Okay, and you can see that, look at this example. You have two different images. One has some sort of uh, salt and pepper noise. One has a very disturbing uh, cross several lines noise, but the PSNR is the same thing because it's an average over all pixels. And obviously, for humans, most likely, they would prefer to see image one rather than image two. That's why people have looked at a number of techniques to represent this, how structural information changes. And one of the most uh, famous ones is the SSIM. This is a procedure for it. And basically, in a nutshell, it looks at several parameters from patches, such as mean and standard deviation. And it looks at these values across different domains in the luminous domain with respect to the correlation, uh, correlation matrix, looking at the contrast matrix and combining all these three elements. Once we combine these three elements, we have one value for each patch, then we average over all patches, and we get now an idea on overall how the structure changes between the original image and the distorted image. And you can see here that the SSIM is one, by the way, for perfect reconstruction, where you have the MSC is zero, or perfect uh, representation. And you can see that the SSIM can represent better the value. You see the MSC is almost the same, but you can see that the SSIM changes. When you look at the last, page, uh, the last uh, image, for instance, the SSIM is only 0.64. So it's a very nice, uh, there are other, uh, other parameters or other matrix. One of them is what we call the virtual image fidelity matrix. I'm not going to go through it, but just to show you that there are a number of ways when you have two images to compare them. One other technique that has been uh, developed is done in the transform domain using what we call the uh, wavelet transform. Basically, you look at the different bandwidths and you look at the distortion across different frequencies. This is an example where you see that the SNR does not tell you much, but you look at the wavelet-based SNR, it gives you a very good representation of the quality and how it changed between the original image and the bottom right of the, of the screen. Obviously, when we speak about videos, there are two issues to consider. Are we going to consider that we have a sequence of images and take the average over this sequence? Or are we going to take into account the time information? And this is just a kind of a summary. So I'm going to focus a little bit on the uh, no reference techniques. And no reference techniques is a bit more challenging. These are most, uh, some of the most famous ones. And I will just give you an example here. So the way it works is trying to understand 
what is good in a natural image. And the way we do it is by, look, by trying to extract some parameters from a given image that you give me, and in this case, 18 features. These, image, these parameters could be uh, statistical, mean, standard deviation, different levels, and so on. Then I use a neural network or support vector machine or so to learn quality because from the original database that I have, I have the scores. So I'm not using uh, the support vector machine as a classifier, but we usually use it as a regressor, meaning that the input are these 18 parameters of 36 and the output is the score, which is obtained subjectively. And after the, I do the training, at the end, when in the testing, I just put the parameters, okay, and I get the score. This is the brisk, and these are the features. Shape, variance, mean, left variance, right variance. Then I take these, vari these, these parameters and fit them to a generalized Gaussian or an asymmetric generalized Gaussian, probabilistically, and we extract some features from this generalized Gaussian, such as uh, the shape parameter and so on. This is another technique where we look at uh, features are not uh, distortion specific. And I should make a comment here that more, the bulk of the literature, when it comes to this difficult case of uh, no reference, they try to target specific distortions. And you can think of a large number of distortions. You can think about white noise, you can think about white noise, uh, pink noise, you can think about distortion due to compression, you can think of distortion due to blurring, you can think of distortion due to certain contrast enhancement technique and so on. So there are actually almost 18 types of distortions. In our work, in our lab, we did some few experiments. I will just explain two of them very quickly because I don't think we have a lot of time. And in our work, what we try to do to say, okay, since we cannot really uh, mimic exactly how the human visual system works, we are trying to, we are going to try to mimic it by looking at the human eye as a set of filters. So we develop what we call low filtering. From Lowe's filters, we extract features. And we use these features to learn through a, a, a generalized regression and their network, what image quality is about. So the whole idea of this learning is to extract information. The only problem that you have is that the information that you extract when you represent noise, when it will be different from extraction that you need to extract or the parameters you need to extract for blurring, etc. That's why 90% or 95% of the techniques de developed target mainly one type of distortion, and this is a big challenge. So these are just some details, and I will share with you the PowerPoint later on. And these are the extracted, these are the different filter, filters that I mentioned. From these different filtered images, we extract some information, uh, such as energy and so on, and we average it over, uh, over the, all, all the image, and we do uh, some sort of fitting using uh, an SDR. Okay? And these are just some results. Uh, one topic that is very dear to my heart, which we developed and has been well cited, is to use the concept of higher order statistics or higher order singular values. I'm not going to give you the motivation here, but the only thing I'm going to tell you about is that because we have these three images, which is for color images, we have the red, the blue, and the green, how can we combine information from these three components? And to do that, what we do is use uh, the uh, concept of tensors. And you can see the concept of tensors is based on this. You take the three color components, either you put one component next to the other, next to the other, so you have a larger image, or you put it row by row, one first row, then first row from second image, first row from third image, and so on, or column by column. So you have three modes. 
And you can see this is an example where we put the red, the green, and the blue, one next to each other. And here we are putting pixel by pixel. And from these infoldings, what we do, we do, we have three modes. We can do single value decomposition, so we get, get eigenvalues. What we found is the following is that how these eigenvalues decay depend on the amount of blur in the image. It's a very interesting, very fascinating result. So instead of looking at the eigenvalues themselves, we look at how they decay and use that as one parameter or two parameters or three at, mo uh, at once, if you use three modes, and use them with the SDR. Instead of using 30 features, we use only two or three features. And this is the parameter for the fitting. And the results are outstanding. This is across a number of databases, CISQ, Live, PID database. These are uh, very famous databases. And this is the way we do the regression. OK, now, instead of focusing only on distortion, there have been also some work on enhancement. So we do a lot of manipulation of the image to enhance it. The big question is, can we use the same techniques that we use for distortion as we do for enhancement? And the answer is no. So you need, because uh, artifacts in enhancement are not like white noise and so on. They are an saturation, texture modification, hollow effect, for instance. Okay, this is an example of the hollow effect, you can see some sort of additional edges uh, next to this uh, uh, metal uh, stand. And there are many techniques that have been developed for contrast enhancement and many techniques that are developed for to measure the quality of contrast enhancement. Okay, so uh, we have developed our own based on the concept of mutual information by using simply the uh, co-occurrence matrix. But however, so what we show here is that the co-occurrence matrix structure changes as we go to blur or an enhanced image. So we look at a projection. So we this is a new approach that we developed. Instead of looking at the values of the co-occurrence matrix, we look at the projection in the x-axis, in the y-axis, we develop a profile, uh, which we call a kind of probabilistic profile, from which we get the joint, uh, the mutual information. And this mutual information can be used uh, as a measure through a regression and so on. So you can see that these are some de uh, details. I'm not going to go through them. Uh, however, uh, I will just finish with uh, maybe in three or four minutes, if you allow me. The, and I, I will start speaking about the challenges here. Once we have this correlation, when we have this measure, which is subjective measure, oh, sorry, objective measure, which could be between 0 and 10, doesn't have to be between 0 and 5, and we have the MOS, I'm talking about in the testing stage. What do we do to see what, the, what, the, what, what we are doing is good or not? Obviously, the simplest answer, if you go to a, any undergraduate student, he will tell you that these are two random variables we look at correlation, which is basically the Pearson linear correlation. But the correlation is only looking at the values. It doesn't take into account how we rank, what do we mean by good and bad value? How do we rank this? So there are a number of other techniques, such as the uh, candle, the Spearman rank technique, uh, the uh, Goodman, and there are many. Because by the way, if you remember from your probability uh, courses, Pearson's technique is only valid for one type of correlation, which is the linear type of correlation. So if you have two signals or two values with a U-shape, between X and Y, where we know that we have perfect correlation, but the person correlation coefficient will not be one, even though that we know it has to be one, because it only tackles one type of correlation. 
The other issue is how do we match the uh, how do we take some these parameters and map them into a, a nonlinear regression, non which takes into account the nonlinearity on how we perceive quality. This is an example. There's a lot of research going on in here. Databases, frankly, there are many databases now that are available that have been developed for quality, uh, for color, for gray level, with hundreds of images, different types of distortions. You can see that a number of distortions is, for instance, in the TID 17. What's next? So I want to speak about, and I will finish with this, with a couple of topics I think are very worthwhile looking at, for, especially for researchers who want to go into this area. The first challenge is modeling the human visual system. I think we are very far from finding the best way to model, to know, how the brain looks at quality. We are just scratching what we call the primary virtual cortex. There's a lot, of, a lot of things to be done to understand how properly the human visual system works, how to model it mathematically, because if we are able to model it mathematically correctly, then we can really use that information to know or to develop measures to measure quality of images and video. This is a whole area of neurocomputing, of perception, <coughs> of visual information assessment and so on. Second, now in reality, we don't have one type of, of distortion. What happens when you have, for instance, noise with edge distortion, with compression, with blurring. What happens when you have what we call supra-threshold distortion, which is threshold that we cannot see as values, but as humans we can perceive it, which is a kind of a, 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 a distortion which is very small below a certain threshold. How do we do that? What happens when you have more than one object? Because we tend to, I always tell my students, long time ago, 15, 20 years ago, when we were looking at the problem of face recognition, we look at the face as a one face into an image, very clear and so on, and try to identify it. The problem is not there anymore. The problem is for in, in airports where you take images of hundreds of people. The same thing. When you have multiple objects interacting, some of them large, some of them high contrast, some of, some of them, uh, some of them more with more edges, some of them with uh, uh, homogeneous texture. How do you quantify all of this information? How do you quantify when we have more than one type of distortion in the same image? Are you going to quantify the uh, the effect of each distortion? then average them or take into account a super system that is able to identify, and we developed a technique that identifies the types of distortions that you have, then from that assess the quality. What when it happens when you have a geometry? You see when you have an object which is shifted or tilted slightly or sheared, as humans, we can recognize that it's the original image with just a little bit of distortion. But we said that one pixel of distortion or shift can be detrimental when you look at objective quality assessment. How do we take into account these geometric changes without distorting really, without, with a good perception of quality? Can we, how do we marry this concept of modeling distortion with modeling enhancement? Can we have ultimately a measure that is able to evaluate quality, no matter what. Just give me an image. Don't tell me whether it is enhanced or distorted. And I will give you an objective assessment of the quality. 
And finally, the problem of fast, fast, fast. We, we are in an era where we want things to be very, very fast. It's good to have an excellent algorithm, but if your algorithm takes seconds to give me value for or to assess the quality of an image, then I'm not interested in it. Can you develop technique? Can you develop algorithm that I can very quickly give me a, a, an assessment of an image? And more difficult, obviously, will be the video. I added the number of issues that I really want you to think with me about this. First of all, this concept of correlation measures. Should we develop? By the way, the only the, 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 the issue is this. Let me just go one step, tell you this just one step further. If I gave you four images that have been distorted from a certain origin of image, can you give me a single value that represents the overall distortion across all the images. Obviously, this brings me to, to a topic that people have tried to avoid completely, which is cor correlation coefficient between more than two random variables. We are all used to this concept of correlation across two variables. What happens when you have three or four variables? What is the effect of time? How about speaking about the ranking process? You give me three, four images, and I rank them instead of giving you values for each one of them. Is it going to be accepted very soon in the medical area? And this is an interesting case, which is this concept of an intriguing case of beauty. Because you see, for instance, if you were to look at evaluate face beauty of female, for instance, in Africa, the way they perceive beauty will be very different from where you were to go to Asia, will be very different to go to Europe. Evaluating beauty itself is a very challenging topic. Uh, we may not like to speak about it too much uh, because these people pay, uh, get a lot of money to just be paid to judge these con contexts and so on. But there is a lot of work going on you know, on how to evaluate. And I am sure that you've heard what, of what we call the golden standard, where they took thousands of uh, models and they looked at the ratio here, the ratio here, and they came up with a golden standard, which kind of represents what we call beauty. What happens when we have videos? Are we going to treat audio and video separately or image feed separately? What is the effect of the or the correlation between the audio quality, the voice quality, and the image quality? Do we need to develop a new set completely new set? Because the way we hear is different from the way we speak. Oh, sorry, exactly. I mean, the way we hear is different from the way we speak. So the voice has certain properties. Obviously, the hearing has a much wider bandwidth than the voice. How do we take into account? How do we embed all of these into what we call quality of experience? I show you an overall video, and you can give me, an, 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 objectively, the computer can give me a value which truly assesses the quality of this video. So you can see that there are many, many challenges, and these are all related to the difficulty in understanding how humans perceive quality, whether we are talking about hearing or visual information very important okay so these are some of the challenges i wanted to share with you share with you also some of the work that we have done there's a lot to be done there are many open questions uh, I, I apologize for taking too much time but uh, uh, feel free to ask me any questions and I will share with you the presentation. And I apologize once again for going over time, uh, Professor Ahmed Zuri. You know, uh, Prof. Derish, uh, Muhammad Derish, you can always take all the time that you want. <laughs> you are happy to be here. Actually, I'm happy to see you again. Thank you, thank you. Me too. I, I, it's, the pleasure is mine. Okay, um, actually, uh, you know, I, I've been teaching signal processing all this while. Uh, when you talk about beauty, you know, when I use the word whitening, it always makes people smile. Okay. Yeah, because, you, but sorry, because you know, in you, signal processing, uh, we have whitening. Uh -huh. Yeah. Whitening filter. 
Okay. Yeah, you know, that, that will always make the, the, the lady smile. Okay. <laughs> because they have another interesting idea about whitening. <laughs> no, actually, yeah. Uh, uh, I'll just... tell you what, uh, Professor uh, Ahmed, I mean, since you mentioned this, it, it's mm -hmm. a very interesting. I mean, I was surprised. I had one of my undergraduate students looking at this problem. And they have what we call this golden standard. It's just amazing. So they look at the ratio of, for instance, between the two eyes over the ratio here, the ratio here, the ratio here, the ratio between the ears, the ratio is here. It's a, and they find that all of these ratios, when they are, when they have a standard deviation which is almost zero, that's the perfect image of an, a female. They do it for female. But, so uh, I don't want to be biased here. But this is what they do. It's, an, uh, it's a, a whole area of research. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I see that there is somebody who mentioned this concept of contrast enhancement. Mm -hmm. Okay. You are, I see, uh, it's very important. So when you have an object versus a background, is that what we tend to usually to avoid this problem of doing everything across the whole image we try to use do what we call local processing so whether we are doing filtering whether we are doing contrast enhancement that's why for instance in image processing you have heard of histogram equalization but there is another version of histogram equalization which is called the local histogram equalization so there are a number of ways when you have an object of a crosser background is either to look at, segment the object and do the contrast enhancement in that region based on the information in that region or look at patches across the image and do processing across the image. So it's, a, it's an interesting topic. That's why you have around, I would say around 10, major taking I will send you a paper we have uh, uh, like a, a very long extended paper on contrast enhancement and measuring contrast enhancement uh, very well cited that we published about two years ago just send me an email and I'll send you it it lists all of the most important or most pop, uh, popular contrast enhancement techniques and how we measure these contrast enhancement now Another topic, obviously, that people are talking about is the concept of deep learning, deep learning, deep learning, deep learning, deep learning. Deep learning. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the reason why it, this concept of deep learning uh, flourished is that now we have very powerful computers. But, but very powerful computers are only one side of the story. The other side of the story is that if you want to do proper deep learning, you need a huge amount of data. That's why people, to avoid this problem, what they do, they go to the ImageNet, which has billions and billions of images, and train their models on these images. But is it correct? If I were to look at images of faces, or if I were to look at seismic images, we have a project on seismic images. Is it uh, reasonable to go to the ImageNet and uh, train your deep learning technique on ImageNet. We're talking about different images altogether. So basically, the concept of deep learning is good. It tells you that if you give me enough data, I will end up by learning. Okay? So, but really, there have been some trials on using deep learning for image quality. I saw some of them. But there are a number of problems. And frankly, uh, about a few few months ago, I listened to a professor who is specialized in deep learning, and he said that he asked his students to summarize the work on deep learning. And out of around 500 papers on deep learning, he only could find a handful, less than 10 uh, papers that speak about the theoretical foundations of deep learning. 
Because most of our students, what they do, they try the unit, the resonant, the VGG, the etc. Uh, oh, this is working, so I'm going to take it and so on. But why? What type of architecture? What type of, how do we select the number of the depth, the number of filters and so on? I think, I think most of the people that are working in deep learning, unfortunately, especially at student level, they are doing it on an ad hoc manner. There is a lot to be learned from these con these concepts, and there is a lot to be learned as well to reflect this knowledge into the human visual system. Yes, any other question? Uh, well, it seems like there's only two questions, but um, I think I would like to ask you a question. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. You see uh, the methods that you propose, okay, and uh, you use it against. Uh, when you want to do benchmarking, you, you compare it against a set of database. Okay. Yes. Now, do you, you know, is there an issue of uh, the results being uh, non-uniform? Non-uniform in terms of the quality? Because uh, will you have a problem where some images... I see the point. I see the point. Compared to some. Is I, that I a problem? The I see the point. Actually, this brings me to two issues. The first issue is that the databases, say the TID database, they realize the problem you're talking about. So what they did is that they considered 17 types of distortions, but for each distortion, they don't just tell you uh, distortion AWGN. They tell you AWGN one, two, three, four, five levels of distortions. So for the same distortion, you have five levels of distortion. So basically, kind of, they tell you that if you do your work and you test it across all of the databases, you are going to have an average across all possible distortions and at different levels of distortions. Okay? So kind of, they are solving this, the problem you're talking about by doing this concept of comprehensive a set of distortions. Okay. All right. Uh, let me see. Okay. So I think that's that's the last question. Uh, yes. Feel free. Obviously, I will be sharing with you, Dr. Ahmed and Professor Rafiq. I will be sharing with you the PowerPoint presentation. Feel free if you have any students that are interested in the topic to speak to me and we should be able to uh, help them uh, understand more or get hopefully interested in the topic. Actually, uh, my last comment before I hand over the session, last comment, okay. Now I noticed that whoever is interested in this particular area, you can see that the last few slides are actually the problems that you should be working on. Yes. And, and the best person that you should collaborate is with Dr. Professor Muhammad Derish. <laughs> it seems like that's the best person for you to collaborate with. Thank you. Okay, Thank so um, our, our dean, uh, Prof. Rafiq, is uh, signaling me, okay, time for me to be. So over to you, Rato. Yeah, audio, audio. <laughs> Nato, I can't hear you. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Mazuri, uh, for letting me know that I'm on, uh, I have to unmute. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mazuri, for sharing the session. And thank you as well to uh, Professor Muhammad Darish uh, for accepting our invitation uh, to speak at our Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, certainly an interesting topic. Uh, just to let you know that uh, my field of expertise is biomedical engineering. So I'm always interested in uh, getting uh, a lot of information from medical images. Uh, you showed, you know, a medical image from uh, maybe perhaps MRR or CT scan. You know, if we can actually extract crucial, uh, crucial information from that medical image, then it is actually very important for the doctors to give the right diagnosis. So uh, certainly interesting to see uh, some very nice uh, pictures in your presentation. So again, thank you so much, Professor Muhammad Darish. Professor Mazuri, thank you so much for sharing the session and for introducing me to Professor Muhammad Darish. Yeah? Thank you, and sir. The pleasure is mine. I'm really happy to come back 
even though we're virtually, to UTM. And I look forward to meeting all of you physically, hopefully very soon. And keep safe uh, and keep healthy uh, and uh, provide uh, convey my salam to all of your colleagues there. Thank, thank you, you so very much. Uh, to all our viewers, thank you for watching. Until next time, bye for now. Bye. 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 B